Okay. So the question was, I'm going to roll a die four times, and I want to know what the probability is of getting exactly one six. Okay. Now the first thing we have to understand, because today we're going to look at a lot of different kinds of probability. This is called binomial probability. Because when you roll a die, in the context of this problem, when you roll a die, you're either going to get a 6 or you're not going to get a 6. For this problem, I am interested in getting a 6. The only other thing that can happen is I don't get a 6. That's called binomial. There's only two options. I'm going to get a 6. I'm not going to get a 6. We know that the probability of a 6 is 1 6, right? We roll it on. And the probability of not a 6 is 5 6. Now I'm going to roll this die four times, and I want to get 1 6. Do I care which 6 it is? Not a bit. So there are going to be four rolls, and I am going to choose one of them to be a six. The order doesn't matter. I don't care if it's the first one, second one, third one, totally doesn't matter. I'm just going to choose one to be a six. Four rolls, one of them is going to be a six. The probability of a six is one six that I want one of those. The probability of not a six is five six and I want three of those. I'm rolling my die four times. One of them is going to be a six. Three of them are going to not be sixes. So that term, multiply that out, and you'll get some decimal, and that will be the answer to the question. Let's do another one along those same lines. Then I'm going to stop because I did a bunch of these in that video. But let's say you're taking a multiple choice test. Each test or each question has five options. You're guessing, let's say it's in you know Russian, you, you can't even read it, you're just randomly guessing at every question. What's your probability? Uh, let's say we got ten questions. What's your probability of at least eight correct? Okay, so it's a ten question quiz. It's multiple choice with A, B, C, D, E options. You are randomly guessing. <coughs> now, what is this at least eight? That adds a complication now. What does that mean? Eight, nine, ten. Eight or nine or ten. So we really have three problems to consider. And we talked about a few days ago, what does this word mean I'm going to do? That's going to be an addition. So I'm going to get an answer here, here, and here, and then I'm going to add them all up. All right, so let's start right here. I want to get eight right. How many questions are there? Ten. I'm picking eight <coughs> to get right. Do I care which eight? So that's ten, C, eight. Now, there are two probabilities associated with that, because there are two things happening in this problem. Either I'm going to be correct or I'm going to be wrong. When I guess, right? Those are the only two options. I'm going to get it right or I get it wrong. What's the probability that I will get it right if there are five options for one each fifth. question? One fifth. one fifth. What's the probability that I'll get it wrong then? Four fifths. For this first situation, I want eight corrects and two wrongs. Right? Next step. What does 9 look like? I'm plus here. What's 9 look like? 10 C9. 10 questions taken 9 at a time. Pick 9 to get right. Any, any 1, any 9. Still going to have 1 fifth and 4 fifths, right? Only this time it's 9 and 1. And then finally, what does all 10 right look like? 10 C 10, 1 fifth to the 10th, and then I always add this part in, but you don't need to. 4 fifths to the 0, you don't need to add that. 
So you would calculate each one of these and add them all up, and that would be your answer. Okay? Now, let's look at, we do have, we've got to get to norms and probabilities here, but I feel like I should do a couple of these morning <laughs> practice problems for you. Oops, that's one. Which, which ones did you feel were the biggest struggle on the morning practice sheet? somewhere in here. Three door? Four. Number four? Now let's look at number four. Uh, how many bracelets with no <coughs> class can I make from ten beads? Okay. This is unfair for of me to ask this question. Now a piece of it, a piece of it you should get. A bracelet with no class. Okay, you know what a clasp is? You know what a clasp is, right? Yeah. When you put a necklace on, if it has a clasp, you fasten it, right? Or your bracelet, you fasten it. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. If, if you put it on and fastened it, what was it before you put it on? It was a line. So if it has a clasp, it's not a circle. It's really a lawn. So if you had 10 beads and a clasp, that would be 10 things in a line. That would be 10 factorial. But if you have no clasp, then it's like something you just slip on your arm, right? You just slip it on. What shape is it? It's a circle. So 10 beads in a circle is... 9 factorial. We talked about that. You're supposed to know that already. When things are in a circle, it's 1 less factorial. So the whole clasp thing, you just got to use your common sense. If it has a clasp, it's really not a circle. You make it a circle when you put it on, but it's really not a circle. If it doesn't have a clasp, then you're slipping it on or putting it on over your head, then it is a circle. Okay? Now, the part that's tricky is, who checked answers? What confused you about my answer? Read or? Divide by two. What's that about? We have never talked about that. So we need to do that now. Where did I put my rag? Oh, there it is. So here we go. you to think about this for a minute. Let's suppose that I have a red bead, a blue bead, a green bead, an orange bead, and a purple bead. Okay? So here they are. Here's my nice little necklace. I can arrange those beads in lots of different ways. So let's look at another way that I could arrange those beads. There's another way. I want you to think about this for a second. Let's suppose I have this arrangement of beads, okay? I'm holding it out here in front of me. I put it on. This is what you see, right? This is the necklace you see around here. But let me slip it back over my head and hold it out here. You still see this, right? What do I see? This. Now, is it a different arrangement? Did I rearrange anything? What did I do? I looked at it from the other side. We call it a reflection. What that means is I can't really count both of these because these aren't two separate arrangements. It's like here's my necklace or my bracelet or whatever and here it is. It's the same thing. I'm just looking at it from the other side. You see what I'm saying? This phenomenon only happens with what we call handheld circular permutations. So things that are arranged in a circle, like a bracelet, or a necklace, or a key ring, those are really the biggies. You can hold them in your hand, they're circular, you can look at them from both sides. 
Remember the other day when I took my favorite students to my house for a bonfire and I sat them around the bonfire? I said, how many ways can we see 10 kids around the bonfire? How many ways can I see 10 kids around the bonfire? Nine factorial. Now that's a circular permutation. Do I divide it by two? No, because I can't look at those kids from both sides. We only divide by two. So, so the answer to the question was, there were 10 beads, nine factorial divided by two. Why the divided by two? Because of the concept of reflections. I can look at these things from both sides. We only divide by two for reflections, kids, if it's a handheld circular permutation. If you can't hold it in your hand and flip it over, then don't divide by two. Okay, anything else on the morning practice sheet that we need to take a look at? Anybody else see one? Emma? Um, I just have a question about the answer for 1A. Okay, do you think it's wrong? <coughs> okay, 1A. Uh, how many ways can I arrange the plates around the table? Okay. All right, so wait a second. How many plates are there? 14 plates, but I'm arranging them around a table. 13 factorial. I don't divide by 2, but I do divide by 5 factorial, 6 factorial, 3 factorial, because why? Read the next sentence. The plates of each color are identical. It's like the I's and S's and P's in the word Mississippi. How do we handle duplicate objects? Things that are exactly the same, we divide by factorial. So 13 is because we're in a circle, and then we're going to divide by all this because no duplicates. They're identical plates. Um, I'm surprised nobody's asking about 1B because that's the con that's another concept we really need to talk about that we haven't. And that's the idea of what we call bundling. So I'd like you to think about this for a minute. Let's suppose that I have eight <coughs> geometry books, four algebra books, and three trig books. And they're all different. These books are all different. How many ways can I arrange on a shelf? Come on, we know. How many ways can we arrange them on a shelf? Don't overthink it. How many books are there? How many ways can I arrange 15 things in a line? 15 factorial. Come on now, we need to get that. Put them on a circular shelf, what would it be? 14 factorial. All right, what if all the geometry books have to be kept together? Okay, and we're on a, a regular shelf. And all the geometry books have to be kept together. Now, here's what's happened. You have taken this pile of books and you've like tied a string around them. You've said these have to stay together. So now I have all my tied together geometry books and then I got these guys and these guys. So how many things am I really arranging then on my shelf? Three of these, four of these, and one of these. So that becomes eight factorial because there are still three of these, three of those books, and four of those books, but now this acts as one because you tied a string around it. But when you tie the string around those eight, that bundle itself could be arranged eight factorial ways. These eight right here, if I said how many ways can you arrange those eight when you tie them up, 
wouldn't that be a factorial? So the answer is a factorial, a factorial. This is the number of things that you're actually arranging. This is the number of ways the bundle can be arranged. All right, let's say books of each kind together. So you're gonna put them on a shelf and you're gonna be organized. You're gonna have all your geometry books and all your trig books and all your algebra books. They're all gonna be organized. So you really have tied a string around all of them. You can't mix them up. So if you do that, if you bundle each kind, how many things are you really arranging? Three. So you start with three factorial. But when you tie the string around these eight, those eight, just those eight, how many ways could you arrange just those eight? Eight factorial, four factorial, three factorial. That's called bundling. When you make things stay together, then they count in the big count as one, but you have to account for their own arrangements too. One more quick example of that. Let's go back, let's say we have five boys, four girls. We're gonna put them in a row. Boys together. Shh. Stop. Five boys, four girls. Um, I'm going to change the number here because I don't like it. Let's make it five boys, eight girls. Five boys, eight girls. I'm going to put them in a row and all the boys have to be together. So what do I start with? If the boys have to be kept together, I'm going to start with nine factorial. Eight girls, a bundle of boys. Nine factorial. But then I have to recognize what about this bundle of boys? When I tied the string around them, I could have done that more than one way, right? How many ways could I arrange them? Five. Five factorial. Okay? All right. If there are other questions on that, we'll have to come back to it because we got a couple of things we have got to look at today. So I need you to get your book out and turn to page. 728. I have your test graded. I just don't have the college school yet. I have to do that. I'm kind of dreading it. Scores range from 20 something to 99. <laughs> So here we go. All right, page 728. We're going to talk about all kinds of probability today. I'm only going to have time to do one example of each kind, so you're really going to have to pay attention, take as good a notes as you can. We're going to spend more time on this tomorrow. Okay? So, number one, a red die and a green die have been rolled. What is the probability that the sum is nine? Now, first of all, we all understand that probability is a fraction, right? Mm -hmm. And the denominator of the fraction is what? Not of this particular problem, but just in general. When you do probability, total options. So in this case, I'm rolling two dice. Okay? How many ways can the first one land? Six. How many ways can the second one land? Six. So how many ways can both of them land together? No. Thirty-six. It's just like if I have eight jumpers and ten shirts, how many outfits do I have? Eight times ten? If the first die can land six ways and the second one can land six ways, then the total options are 36 ways. So your denominator for all of this set of problems is going to be 36. That won't change. 
Now what goes in the numerator of the probability? What you want, right? The chance, you know, how many ways you can get what you want. Well, what do we want? We want the sum to be nine. So we have our red die and our green die, and we want the sum to be nine. So tell me what could happen. How could I get nine? I could get three and six, or six and three. Keep in mind those are different because the color on the die are different. Four and five. Four and five, or five and four. Is that it? So there's only four ways to get a nine. So your numerator is four. So four out of 36, which you would reduce to one nine. Every one of those problems has a denominator that's 36 and a numerator that you're just going to figure out how many ways you can get what you want. Okay? That's pretty easy. All right, next. Number 17. Okay, these are really simple. 17 says, okay, read the question. Um, peanut version of the same candies, like peanut M&M's, has all the colors, da, 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 da. So somebody's opened a bag of candy and found out that 30% of them are brown, 20% of them are red, and so on. So number 17 says, what's the probability that if you draw out a piece of candy from two brand new bags, what's the probability from each of two brand new bags, what's the probability both will be brown? Well, what's the probability the first one will be brown? 0.3. So here are my two bags. The probability I get a brown one out of here is 0.3. What's the probability I'll get a brown one out of this one? 0.3. What do I do with those two numbers? It's brown and brown. What do I do with them? It's not brown or brown. It's brown and brown. What do I do with them? Jumper and shirt. What do I do with them? Multiply. So the probability is 0.09. When you are doing two things at the same time, rolling green and rolling red, you multiply. Picking brown and picking brown, you multiply. Number 20. The first is brown and the second is yellow. What's the probability the first one will be brown? 0.3, what's the probability the second will be yellow? 0.2, total probability then? 0.06. You multiply those, brown and yellow. Now be careful, look at number 19, there's something a little bit different about number 19. What's different? It's not ordered. So if we want to end up with a red one and a green one, we could get red green or green red. Would you agree with me? The problem isn't ordered. So there are two ways I could end up with a red and a green M&M. &M. I could pick red first and then green or green first and then red. So what's the probability of red first? <laughs> What is it? Point two. Point two. What's green? Point two. All right. And then what's oh, the green? Now, what do I do with these two numbers? What do I do with these two numbers? What do I do with these two numbers? So the answer is 0.08. Do you see the difference between problem number 19 and problem number 20? You have got to read. Number 28, Venn diagram. How many of you have seen a Venn diagram before, like in biology or something? Number 28, it says we have a sample space S, so this is S, and inside of there, we have A happening and B happening. Now the notation 
When we say the probability of A is 0.7, that's what that notation means. The probability of being in circle A is 0.7. The probability of being in circle B is 0.4. And the probability of being in both circles, and this upside down U is the symbol for being in both, that's the and, for being in both circles, um, is 0.2. Now I need you to be careful here for a second because what do you notice if you add up these probabilities? This is greater than one. That's a problem. That's a problem, isn't it? So you need to understand what's happening here. The probability of A and B is 0.2. <coughs> they are represented right here. This is the overlap between the two circles. Those are the people that are A and B. So let's say the A, let's say A is um, love math and B is love English. So I say to you guys, who loves math? And 70% of you raise your hand. And then I say, okay, but change that. Who loves English? And 40% of you raise your hand. What does this mean? What did these people do? They raise their hands twice. Now, everybody that likes A was in that 70%. If 20% of them are included over here too, that leaves only 50% to be in this part of the circle. Does that make sense to you? The whole A ball is 0.7, but 0.2 of them have already been counted. These are the guys that raise their hand twice. And then this part would be what? 0.2. Now, you've got 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 represented in the circles. What does that add up to? That's only 0.9. Wait a minute, where's the other point one? They are the people that didn't raise their hands at all. They're out here. They're not in the circles. Because when I said, do you like math, they didn't raise their hand. And when I said, do you like English, they didn't raise their hand. Now we can answer the questions. Find the probability that A occurs but B does not. What's the probability A occurs and B does not? 0.5. B occurs but A does not. Probability of neither A nor B. Okay, tonight you'll have to do a Venn diagram, but it'll be structured just like that. I mean, that'll be the same strategy you'll use. Okay, now I need to look at number 20. I already did that one. Now I need to look at number 30. This is called conditional probability. So take a minute and read it. <coughs> kinds of problems, I like to set up what's called a tree diagram. Okay, so I'm going to start by saying, all right, on any given day, we're either going to have meatloaf or we're not going to have meatloaf. Would you agree with that? What's the probability that we'll have meatloaf? Read it, it's in the question. Tell you. One fifth. I can use fractions or I can use decimals, whatever you like best. But if the probability I'll have meatloaf is one fifth, then what's the probability I won't have meatloaf? Four fifths. Good. Now, in addition to either having meatloaf or not having meatloaf, 
I'm going to have peas, or I'm not going to have peas. Now, do you see why this is called conditional probability? The probability of having peas changes, right? If you have meatloaf, what's the probability you're going to have peas? It says in there, what is it? 70%, so I'll say 7 tenths. If I don't have meatloaf, I mean, if I do have meatloaf, then there's a 3 tenths possibility I won't have peas because there's a 7 tenths I will, so there's a 3 tenths I won't. Now, what if I don't have meatloaf? What's my probability for peas? 3 Three tenths? So this is 7 tenths. Now, the probability of having meatloaf and peas, what would I do with these two numbers if it's meatloaf and peas? Multiply. So that would be seven peas. Meatloaf and not peas would be three fiftieths. Not meatloaf. And peas would be 12 fiftieths. And not meatloaf and not peas would be 28 fiftieths. So each branch of the tree diagram has its own. You guys, come on. Each branch has its own probability. So what is the question after all that? What's the probability the cafeteria serves meatloaf? You already told me that's one fifth. What's the probability the cafeteria serves meatloaf and peas? Meatloaf and peas would be 7 fiftieths. What's the probability we serve peas? Well, we can serve peas on this branch, which would be 7 fiftieths, or we can serve peas on this branch, which would be 12 fiftieths. So what's the total probability that we'll serve peas? 19 fiftieths. Yep, we add them together, because we could get peas here or here. Two more kinds of probability, One, and both of these we've already talked about. The card problems. Let's be dealt a standard or a five card hand from a standard deck. What's the probability of exactly three spades? Five card hand from a standard deck. <coughs> we want three spades. Okay, so let's split our deck. How many cards are there total in the spade pile? 16. 13. 13 spades, right? How many in the other pile? This is not a hard question. 39. So you have 13 cards that are spades, and you have 39 cards that aren't spades, right? So from this staff, I need to pick three. Does the order I pick them matter? No. So that would be 13 <coughs> C3. And... I am picking two cards that aren't spades. What would that look like? 39C2. This is my numerator. This is the ways that I can get three spades and two other cards. What's my denominator? This is a probability question. What's my denominator? Not 52. 52C5. Every single time you do a card problem and it's probability involving a five card hand, that will be your denominator, 52C5. 
your numerator will be whatever it is that you want. Let's try one more. What's the probability of at least four diamonds? What does at least four diamonds mean? Four or five. At least four? Four or five. Four or five. Kids with the five card hand. So what would the denominator of this problem be? 52C5. So whatever happens in the numerator, the denominator is 52C5. There are 52 cards, you're choosing five. All right, what does four diamonds look like? 13 C4, because there's 13 diamonds. But don't forget, the fifth card has to be not a diamond. Don't forget about him just because he's not mentioned. There's five cards. Four are diamonds, one is not. Or 13C5, 39C0, if you choose to include that, you do not need to since you're not looking at it. And the last question, number 40. Let's do the exactly five questions. There are going to be eight questions on the final exam, and we want to get five of them right. Which five we get right? So we're just going to pick five to get right. We don't care which five it is. We're going to pick five to get right. We're going to get five of them right, and obviously then three of them wrong. <coughs> What's the probability I'll get my question right? <coughs> Careful. It tells you in the in the problem. What's your probability of knowing the one of the questions he's going to ask? Eight of twenty. What? Eight of twenty. Not eight of twenty, but it's something of twenty. It's fourteen out of twenty. Forget getting five right. Just forget that for a moment. You walk in to take the exam, there are 20 possible questions he could ask you. How many of them do you know? 14. 14. So you have a 14 20 chance of knowing the question. You see what I'm saying? So this probability is 14 20 What then is this one? 6 20 doesn't have anything to do with that probability. The eight is how many questions there are on the test, and you're going to get five of them right. Your probability of knowing any given question is 14 20 Tonight, your homework is on that page. It's all those different kinds of problems. So give it your best shot. Tomorrow we'll do a recap. Wednesday we'll do a recap. Thursday I have planned the test. I may have to push that back a day and we'll just see how things go. But be on the list. On the I'll get these tests put in as soon as I can.